I wanted to quickly touch upon this because I thought this is interesting and I think this probably needs to be spoken about because I've seen a lot of people kind of mention it online and I didn't want to uh, let it go by without kind of chucking out my little two pence. So I think some of you may be aware, especially if you're in the scene and whatnot and you care about techno, you care about club culture and whatnot. If you don't, then I guess skip ahead of all this stuff but because I'm going to get a little bit in the weeds with the stuff, a little bit in, inside baseball talk. But for the last, what, couple of days or week or whatnot, this interview um, featuring a guy called Nicholas Rose on the platform Playful magazine, which I follow on Instagram, which I definitely think is one of the premier type of um, platforms and publications that are focusing on highlighting people within club culture, within techno, within whatever else it may be, an extended universe when it comes to kink and whatnot, blah, blah, blah. And they do a really good job of kind of filling the gap that RA kind of used to kind of fill with their RA exchanges because I think RA exchanges are basically turned into another arm of press and promo but at its core when it first or when I first kind of got into listening to RA exchanges especially when I was kind of you know in the depths of Canning Town minding my business living in ends and kind of living far away from the scene RA exchanges were a really cool way to kind of transport myself into that world of techno of club culture of electronic music of dance music in general and kind of hear from the voices that kind of was spearheading things and doing interesting cool things and even the journalists that they kind of got to kind of you know interview these people were really inquisitive really clued up knew what they were talking about so you got a real understanding of what was going on and of course back then on ra the comments are open so you would hear somebody talking about a certain issue and you go into the comments and you hear somebody else who's got you know another perspective or another set of experiences kind of you know contradicting or adding to whatever so it was a really cool little dialogue you kind of got an understanding of what the scene was about and i felt like i was able to kind of gain a real understanding of what was going on without being anywhere near it and this was back when i used to live at home in canning town so i was in the depths of you know of my flipping of that life over there and ends um, away from everything not close to clubs not fold didn't exist back then even though it was around the corner from where i used to live by but playful magazine has definitely filled that gap so i definitely recommend you check them out they've got a really cool instagram they do a really cool online magazine which i think comes physically as well you can buy on their site so big up them for always putting together really good interviews and i always try to make sure that i kind of check out most of them and one of them that kind of went semi-viral on my side of the social media was this interview um which is titled having a ghb addiction and how the drug can affect the techno scene um which is an interview with this guy called nicholas sorry with this person i think was it this person how do you say it with the pronouns with with someone called nicholas rose this interview is really interesting because if if i'm not mistaken nicholas rose was the person who during the peak of the pandemic was at the center of a pretty serious controversy regarding rso at that time i think it was called like river riviere sudust and you know formerly grease Mueller. and he essentially had a little bit of a kerfuffle at the club where he was told to put on a mask i think as the story goes he was told to put on a mask and when he was in the middle of smoking or ordering a drink that little interaction with a security guard or a bouncer went left and then he got chucked out and then you know the kind of reaction from him the next day or the following day was to go to instagram and basically accuse um, that club at the time of discrimination and say they were racist and saying they were homophobic and blah, 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 which essentially led to River Sudus at the time closing down, if I'm not mistaken. Again, this is during the peak of the pandemic. So everyone's suffering. Um, no one's able to go out. No one's able to play. Everyone's going stir crazy, locked into their house. And then I think there was a little gap of opportunity where people were allowed to put on these kind of outdoor raves, which essentially were just, you know, people, you know, DJing, you know under a roof but there was no kind of walls kind of thing and people kind of getting around that sort of loophole that way and people understand them more understanding of the situation that was going on and trying to kind of you know acquiesced but to do that in the midst of that kind of drove the club with all the outrage online it kind of forced them to close down which essentially led to loads of bookings being cancelled so you can only imagine how people felt who were gonna play there people that were gonna go there playing trips myself included i was planning to go there all that time and that kind of shut things down and then in the end i think people got fired if i'm not mistaken <laughs> off the back of it and i think he even maybe got a job if i'm not mistaken did he get a job something happened anyway he got some sort of like sorry they got some sort of um advisory role or something i forgot what it was don't, don't hold me to it but i do remember the actual video i've actually got it here original video on the instagram account called rave don't stop and i think this is the original video of it where he kind of where they sorry where they kind of came out and said 
um, about their issue regarding um, their experience at River Sudas. Everybody, so today I'm going to talk about my experience at the new Gleese Mula at the Sinoid party uh, a few days ago. Oh yeah, quickly just stop it again because I always do this when I'm playing videos. I just I, I didn't remember at the time, but this is during Sinoid as well. So Sinoid, if you're not mis if I'm not mistaken, again I'm not in Berlin. I don't live there. I just visit there, you know, periodically here and there during the year. But if I'm not mistaken, it's usually one of the parties that's always oversubscribed anyway. It's usually always you know super busy. They sell out tickets. It's super in demand, and it effectively attracts the hardcore you know side to side big boot stepper type of people who kind of you know legitimately think being into techno and going to raise as a personality trait maybe the worst of the worst so you can understand maybe you know temperatures being a little bit raised because of that kind of crowd right because if you're a club you're going to like having them there because they bring people and people bring money and they spend money at the bar but then if you work there it might be a bit of a hassle because they're just a bit annoying in it and it kind of rub you up the wrong way so many people were on edge to begin with because of the rave itself to begin with it was disgusting what i dealt with and i think that it is very important that as many people as possible hear what i went through and experienced because based on my identity and just who i am i've experienced a lot of things that the average cis white person probably wouldn't even have nightmares about experience. I'm special. I wrote out a little bit of some notes to just keep things in proper chronological order. And I'm going to keep it pretty cut and dry so you get the facts. And it's up to you to decide how you feel about it. So, between the hours of 3.15 and 4.15 a.m. on August 15th, going into the next day, I attended Sinoid at Gleesmula. It was fun the first several hours. And around the hour of 4 a.m., it became very fucked up. As they were very strict about masks, and that's understandable, the way in which they treated me was nasty and unexplainable. As I stood in line for the bathroom to obtain water after dancing several hours, I was approached by one of the crew and I told I was not wearing my mask properly. As he said that I responded and I haven't even taken off my mask at all. He replies that it needs to be a little bit more up and I explained to him that my nostrils weren't even showing in the slightest. It's pretty much like this. The mask entailed, uh, it went a little bit further down my nose uh, simply to the point of my nostrils. At that moment, a little bit confused, I replied, okay, I don't see what the issue is, but uh, please explain because it's still in my face. To which he replied, if you wish to drink anything, you have to be sitting down. And my response was, I have been dancing for three hours straight, and I asked if it would be okay if I sat down in this particular spot on the ground and uh, have some water there. He says, okay. So I go ahead and I sit down on the ground to take my water, and I think at this moment he may have taken it as a joke. So I stand up to finish my drink of water before I walk off and at that moment he opens up a conversation with my friends in German, completely excluding me, which does also tend to happen out here. <laughs> How dare somebody in Berlin <laughs> speak in German in front of me, all right? Don't they know who I am, right? How dare you? <laughs> Honestly, Nicholas, man, well gone, man. You need to relax, man. This is too much, too much. I say to them, can you translate this conversation to me? Because I don't know what's going on right now. He ignores me and walks away. I, uh, I talk to my friends and they say, you know, they don't... <laughs> If there's one thing we know about Nicholas, again, I don't know this guy from a lick of paint, never interacted or met him in real life at all. And all I have to judge is these couple of clips, right? This clip and obviously the one we're going to talk about later in the interview. But from what I've been able to ascertain, Nicholas wants to be seen at all points. Nicholas must be seen. They must be seen. If you don't see Nicholas, Nicholas will make you aware that he, you, you have not seen Nicholas and Nicholas must be seen. That's the one thing. So the fact that the bouncer just walked away <laughs> must have been so crushing. I think he's very happy that you uh, sat down and drank your water. So just be patient for a second. Uh, all of a sudden, he brings this very big, heavy, cis German white dude over to me and asks me, how do you know he was cis? How do you know that? Please, how do you know he was? Judging, judging. If I can speak German or English. I said, I don't speak German. I only speak English and I would appreciate it if you can continue to speak English for the duration of this conversation. <laughs> Honestly, the ego and the demands on these people, man. I don't understand this. Legit, man. Raving isn't that deep. And even if it is that deep, the one thing that you don't do is try to start an argument or get into some sort of, you know, verbal altercation back and forth with a bouncer. I think I said that in my original clip before. It never ends well. It really never ends well. Never in the history of raving in my extensive years, right, going on to 
maybe two decades worth of raving have i ever won an argument with a bouncer i've never once had an argument with a bouncer where they've told me to do something and i said no or some or whatever some sort of you know back and forth like that where they've said you know what you're right mate don't worry have a good time here's here's a couple of tokens on me actually i'll have a drink that's never happened even if they're wrong you still get chucked out even if they're wrong you still get chucked out you still get your marching orders and if you don't get your marching orders you get physically thrown out like flipping jazzy jeff in the in the flipping fresh prince of bel air that's what happens so demanding that you get addressed in one way and all this sort of stuff is legitimately insane in my opinion especially if you want to remain at the party if you don't care about remaining fair enough you know kamikaze the thing but if you care about being there maybe lowering your tone you know not being maybe so confrontational maybe trying to avoid getting into some sort of back and forth and maybe trying to meet the person where they're at that may go a long way to kind of get you back into their good graces maybe who knows but again who, what am i who, what do i know your other colleague is excluding me purposely from a conversation that i know is directly about me refusing to speak english and then also knowing fluently how to speak english is crazy to me <laughs> he says to me listen i don't care now what's crazy to me is you demanding that people in Berlin speak to you in English because you can only speak English. That's legitimately insane. I need to ask you a simple question again. Do you speak English or German? <laughs> so I respond in this. Nicholas is a legend. Listen, dude, do you not hear me? Are you not listening to what I just said? He said, Yeah, I heard you. Uh, but answer the question. And I said, Well, I speak English. Wow. He says, Well, you're wearing your mask inappropriately, and we have noticed that this is an issue. You need to wear your mask properly, or there will be consequences. I said, I legitimately forgot, because this has been a long time, this is 2021. I forgot how badly they came across in this, man. Looking back, I literally forgot, which makes sense why in this new interview, you know, again, I'll just finish this bit and then we'll talk about it anyway. But yeah. Listen, dude, my mask was not fully off my face. I don't understand why you are getting up on me when there are actually 10 cis white people standing right around me, all white men, talking freely and dancing or shifting. <laughs> he says, we aren't talking about them, we're talking about you. And I responded, my mask is not even being worn properly to you, uh, but to me it is. And I'm sweating a lot from dancing and so it is expanding and moving a lot but it's still not below my nostrils. And he says, well, I don't know how to help you. I asked if it's possible, can you give me an extra mask if you have one? Because if the team has one, I would be glad to wear it. So I can comply and make sure that that situation is de-escalated. So while I'm standing on my phone, he aggressively walks me to the entrance of the club. I then ask if he's helping me to get a mask and he refuses to respond. <laughs> classic, classic bouncer trick. And this has happened to me a couple of times in London, illegitimately. I'm going to say this with just a level of certainty that I don't usually apply to things that I say. But in 99.9% .9 of the times that I've ever been chucked out of a club, and it happens, it happens many, it happens for various reasons. Don't need to always be fights or anything un unbecoming it could just be you just being annoying because you're just too drunk and too lit and too high or whatever not and just get on people's nerves without realizing that's one thing that drugs and alcohol does it kind of numbs your inhibitions it also numbs your rear uh, it kind of numbs your cringe receptors and how you are uh, responding and adapting and flowing people around you. you don't really understand it so in your head it's kind of like it reminds me a little bit of like um the guy in between us in your head you think you're the you think it's jay right you think you're the flipping lady killer you think you're getting all the nosh you think all the girls are flipping they will have to carry mops around with them every time they see you somewhere because you're going to get them all wet and stuff that's what you think in your head but in actuality you're annoying everybody you're jumping into people's conversations you're asking them the same questions 17 times you're touching them you're whatever like you're just you're invading their personal space all these things are happening without you realizing it so usually in those in those events or in those occasions people that are not as high or drunk as you can see that and there's no need to get in a conversation they just tell you to leave like hey you probably had enough it's probably time for you to go home and in some cases they'll even give you a bottle of water on the way out hey here a bottle of water you know take it easy be chill and then sometimes if you forget and you you know you're just too high and you come back the next time they'll be like hey don't you remember what happened to you last time next time just chill out relax it's kind of like a you know a normal conversation because they know most likely you know it happens to most people that go out enough times you're definitely going to have some occasions where you just get a little bit too crazy most of the times when it does happen it happens like that person or the bouncer whoever it is the security guard will say hey come with me let me talk to you <laughs> it's such a good one and let me talk to you, talk to you. It'll be over here over here over here 
and then quickly when short quickly without you realizing you're outside of the club and the person may talk to you they may actually have a conversation with you and at the end they say hey by the way this is the end of your night you're not going to get back in anymore and then if you need to get a coat your coat back you give them your, your, your flipping token they'll get it for you and stuff whatnot but that's essentially end of your night but sometimes you just say hey just go home just leave relax you're, you're too lit just leave go away and usually in that moment if you're not too over the edge well, as soon as that person says that to you, it kind of snaps you out of your little delusion and your little kind of, you know, reality. And you start to realize, oh, cool, that is true, actually. I am actually a bit too messed up. You get a bit embarrassed, so you just kind of sulk away, right? You kind of sliver away and kind of go back home. But obviously for this person, not so much. To respond, keep uh, constantly still uh, pointing towards the door. And then, I, and then I ask one more time and he says, you're out. <laughs> so keep in mind for about, uh, keep in mind I have no belongings. Five to six minutes, I go back and forth with him and his colleagues as to why it's important for me to have a belonging when they're kicking me out. And he says, well, okay, you can go get your bag since it's checked. And I reply that uh, it's not just my bag, but my other small pack, which has the rest of my important belongings in it, such as my phone, keys, wallet, and uh, residence ID card. They respond with, uh, uh, why would you bring your identification to a club like this? And I said, well, since you're from Germany, you probably don't face the same consequences I do as an American citizen, but I must have my identification on my person at all times. In the worst case, something does happen, you know? Anyway, you get the idea. Nicholas was left outside um, in the clothes that they were wearing when they went to the rave. I think it was some sort of bikini, some sort of very light, not very adapt, you know, not very appropriate for the outdoor weather. So clearly it was a bit of an affront in that way. So, you know, it could have been dealt with in a better way. But at the time, I think I initially said that clearly this was an issue, maybe a personal issue that Nicholas went through with the bounce or security guard. I don't think this was indicative of the whole establishment, but... Because Nicholas came out so aggressive, so forthright in that the whole institution, the whole club itself was, you know, discriminating against him because of his, because he was homosexual, because he's black, it essentially um, led to the club having to kind of pause all future bookings and essentially go on a little bit of a enforced sabbatical to kind of get things sorted out in the background. And in the process, people got fired. They hired a new security team who were more maybe culturally aware, sensitivity training, all this sort of nonsense, just because one person had a bad altercation with a bouncer who was maybe a little bit jobs worthy, a little bit high on their flipping authority and whatnot. But that essentially, in my opinion, wasn't the right way to go about things. Because I think I said at the time, if that was me and I felt like it was a personal issue that I went through, because this sounds like it, you know, you get into a bit of a back and forth with a bouncer, you just kind of, you know, you DM the club themselves, you contact them after hours, you maybe visit them during the week. I don't know how it works out there. Berlin but you could get in contact with them directly to kind of raise your grievances and if you don't get the response that you you know like or that doesn't kind of make you feel good then maybe you can go on the tear and start destroying them online but I thought to go straight online and say what you're saying knowing the power of social media especially in that moment post George Floyd I don't know it just felt a little bit irresponsible so they decided to go and play for magazine and now it's a different pivot it feels like so it went from being an advocate for inclusion and representation in the club to suddenly now becoming an advocate for GHB awareness. And if you're not aware, GHB, for whatever reason, has taken a, it's taken a really crazy grip on the scene out there in Berlin from what I've been led to believe. From the time that I've been going out there for a few years now, I've kind of seen it increase in popularity. I think I was kind of exposed to it for the first time, actually, in the Berghain Tullers, which is really funny. Essentially, I was um, in there on my own, as you do when you go to Berghain, you always meet cool, interesting people in there. I ended up befriending a group of gay guys, and then we ended up just hanging out, dancing, chilling out, whatever, doing, doing what we need to do. And then we went into the toilets to, you know, do our adult business. And when we were in there, I didn't even know, what, I'd never seen what GSB was, never heard of it in my life. And then when we were in there, they were all kind of pouring out these little liquids into flipping water caps, right? And I was like, oh, what's this? And then they told me what it was and they were all getting lit. And I like, do you want some? I was like, oh, no, I'm good. Because I I think when I was speaking to one of the persons inside the flipping the toilet, they were like, oh, you can't really drink on it. You kind of have to make sure you only take a certain amount and be really strict about it because it can get a little bit crazy after a while. And then that's the first time I've ever seen it in my life. And then over the subsequent years i've seen more and more people be taking it like openly these times because the before it was like a bit of a secret -y kind of thing only those in the know would know and now it kind of feels like it's way more popular especially within the gay community of people who kind of tend to i guess take it because it maybe relaxes you it maybe it's euphoric who knows what the reason is but for some reason gay people specifically have kind of really latched onto it so it's become a real big problem for some people in the dance music scene but i just feel like in this instance, talking about GHB addiction 
and trying to raise awareness to, for it and whatnot. I just feel like interviewing or having Nicholas Rose to be the spearhead for it just isn't the right way to go about it, especially when you consider. From what, I, from what again, I listened to this entire interview. I think the only thing I missed out was maybe the last 10 minutes. But from what I've been able to glean, I understand um, Nicholas has only been clean off of GHB since December or something. So it's been less than, a, less than two months since they've been clean off of GHB. So to have somebody that hasn't even been a year sober or a year abstaining from GHB now suddenly talking about the ills and the wrongs of it, is really yeah, it doesn't really make much sense especially when you kind of frame it with what happened with the last um sort of interaction we've seen of nicholas which is obviously regarding the issue with river Sudus. because from what we've been able to ascertain this was around the time when ghb was really taking a grip on nicholas's life at that time but in this interview from what i had as from what i again listened i've listened all the way up to an hour i've heard no acceptance or understanding or acknowledgement of what ghb did to nicholas at that time that could have affected how nicholas viewed the experience that they went through in the club with the bouncer so that lack of um personal responsibility kind of rubbed you up the wrong way and in general just just me kind of speaking from my side of things i just didn't feel like he came across as the most believable person in the world it kind of just felt like this is a bit of a grift in the one way shape or form there was a lot of me 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 talk there was a lot of rambling the interview didn't really get many questions in he was really kind of, he went on there with a plan or they went on their story with a plan to kind of get their kind of point across of what they wanted to speak about without very little kind of, I felt like personal inventory. Because if you're going to talk about these things, you have to really talk about the ugly side of things and own up to your own faults. And I felt like there wasn't much of it in this case. And for someone like myself, who's kind of dabbled on both ends of it, I've kind of went at clubbing with the idea of getting effed up for the most part because i wanted to kind of escape my reality so you just kind of kind of run full pelt at the drugs and the drinking and places like clubs and dance music or electronic music in general is a great way to escape from your reality especially if you're doing it on the kind of weekly basis you can kind of get wrapped up in that world and think that's all that really matters and you know it can kind of really kind of alleviate all the kind of pains you're going through but one acknowledged one thing i think most people would acknowledge who kind of go out a lot is that drugs and drinking does really sometimes especially if you do it a lot it can negatively affect you in terms of your personality how you react and act to things i know for me it can definitely negatively affect me and kind of bring out the worst of me and i think in general there's maybe a part of us especially when you drink and you do drugs where it kind of magnifies who you actually are and it kind of rids you of any inhibitions so you just kind of you don't have any filter but i feel like much like um what movie is it? I think it's a movie. I think it's Interstellar. I think it's Interstellar. Where I think the robot, the personal robot that he had that kind of walks like that, right? Like a Tetris block. Um, there's a scene in it where, um, what's his face? Oh, I forgot the main guy's face. But there's a scene in it where he basically says, oh, what's your honesty rating barometer? Because I think this this robot basically speaks as a personality, whatever. And he says, oh, it's at 90% because humans can't handle 100% honesty because we're emotional beings. And I feel like, in general in life you can't go around being 100 percent honest with people because you know it can maybe get you in trouble and i feel like drugs and alcohol can sometimes get you to a point where you want to be your true self but it can be too much for some people and you can maybe sometimes say things that you probably shouldn't say and it can obviously if you do it enough it can definitely ruin your life and ruin relationships because people just don't want to have that energy around them and i feel like in this entire interview nicholas didn't touch on that side of things he didn't really get into the weeds into the real dark side of things where it can really go left because if he did do that or sorry if they did do that they would have to acknowledge all the ills all the wrongdoings that they've done throughout their existence or throughout their time over there in berlin and clearly they're still not maybe comfortable or willing to accept what they've done in order for you know the situation they've kind of been in overall it just felt like i was listening to somebody who essentially got lost in the source and is generally just lost in terms of a career in terms of a purpose because i've always said in general that as much as I love club culture and I love dance, I love dance music, I love electronic music, I love DJ culture, everything about it. And I feel like it came for me at the right point in my life where I was going through some stuff at home and I went to just escape and I went to go somewhere where I can just kind of forget about my troubles and whatnot. And I got absorbed into it from club promoting, from designing flyers, from booking DJs to DJing myself to making music or trying to make it going and doing techno tourism all those things were so impactful in my life especially the people i met along the way it was incredible but 
you can get lost in the source. It happens to the best of us. It does happen. When you go out enough times, you can start to kind of overwhelmed with everything, with the drugs, with the alcohol, with the dopamine of just meeting new people. You can just be a bit crazy, especially when you add all the sexual element to it. It can just get really, really nuts. But then outside of that, you also know that it's very important to live a somewhat fulfilling and fruitful life outside of clubs outside of nightlife that can give you some sort of purpose and can ground you and then you can use the clubs as a kind of way to essentially release and have a good time at the end of the week which is what it should be served as i'm not really a big from in my opinion i don't really think you know you should be raving into mondays every single week i think that should be that should be definitely reserved for times when there are legitimately public holidays but i feel like the whole idea behind toiling monday to friday and then enjoying yourself on the weekend is definitely something that's needed for all humans if you enjoy that kind of thing and enjoying yourself could be just you sitting down with a vodka at home you reading a book you going on an extended walk you whatever everyone's got their own version but that definitely does need to exist but at the heart of it there needs to be a grounding of something real and i feel like once you just frame your entire personality around clubs and around going out you might end up like a nicholas where you essentially are so warped and wrapped in your own reality that you that you just can't see the hypocrisy of what you're kind of saying and i feel like in this entire thing advocating for you know ghb awareness and you know safety and whatnot without really confessing and being upfront with how badly it's affected you and the way it's kind of impacted your life and the way it's kind of negatively impacted people around you blah 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 is a little bit disingenuous and essentially just makes me feel like this is a ploy to kind of shift the narrative and change it and kind of become this drag drug advocacy person it without even doing the work that needs to be done internally before you step out and do it because in my opinion i would imagine this is just me speaking again me only i guess you know from a distance here but if i if it was me i don't think anybody who's kind of you know talking about drug awareness should be talking about it if they haven't you know done the work in terms of being sober from that said drug for a prolonged period of time at minimum it should be a year at minimum but if you're two months deep into your awakening of like oh ghb overuse of it is bad and it can make you into a horrible person and it can ruin your relationships and da, da, da. it doesn't necessarily mean in two months that you've kind of seen everything now and now suddenly now you're an expert and you can kind of preach to others that's really disingenuous and especially for the people out there who are doing ghb responsibly and living a somewhat decent life it happens but there are some of us that can't do this stuff like you know whatever it may be but one of the things that really made me laugh was this little exchange here it's in 47th minutes right where um, nicholas rose is talking about one time helping somebody and after hours because i think there's a lot of talk around this podcast around after hours so it feels like ghb maybe because of how long the high is but for whatever reason ghb has become a really big drug in the after hour scene of people going to clubs and then going to and up maybe another club or somebody's home usually maybe an airbnb and partying out throughout the entire day and it's become a real big drug in that kind of scene and you know nicholas kind of touches on one instance where somebody essentially overdosed or maybe had too much and nicholas was there to comfort them but i thought this exchange was hilarious because it just kind of shows the hypocrisy of this whole situation and just how crazy this whole interview was in general and so i remember sitting down with the girl when she was comatose rubbing her forehead and i was saying beautiful things you're beautiful you're gonna be okay you're gonna be okay your body is going to recover you're the people kept saying what are you doing and i'm like shut up get out i'm like da -da -da, it's gonna be all right an hour later, she wakes up. She's awake, gay. Everyone's like, oh, she's awake. <laughs> it's dark, but babe, it's real. It's dark, but it's real. It's dark, but it's real. <laughs> and the girl, do you know what she says? She, she stopped the music. Everyone's like, what? She says, you guys are all so fake. You guys thought I couldn't hear you. Guys, I felt what you guys. It's like a scene out of Gossip Girl, isn't it? Like, press F for doubt, but let's continue were saying about me and that was so hurtful nicholas i could feel you were the only one who took care of me am i wrong and i was like oh my god she actually knew what was happening while she was unconscious the words people say are so powerful and they carry so much energy she literally knew people were all saying these things about her because she could feel it in her body when she woke up but she also knew there was someone there to comfort her that whole time she's like i felt like someone was saying something really positive to me during that whole time though wait for at the it, same wait time for it, wait for it, wait for and it. i was like she was like, that was you, wasn't it? I was like, yeah, it was. It was. And, and she were was like, you on G at this time? At that point? Yeah, I was, but I also still at this point. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> this entire I saved this um damsel in distress and after hours one you know one hour into an overdose or a fainting wherever it was in the middle of somebody's apartment the fact that there are pe- honestly the fact that there are people in the scene who would willingly just sit with somebody without calling the, the ambulance or whatever medical services and just wait with them to wake up for an hour or whatever it may be is insane in my opinion legitimately if that's a scene you're in because clearly at this point you're not in it for the music you're just in it for the drugs so you essentially you're all drug addicts which is what it is but let's just call it what it is let's not try and disguise it as like oh the scene the scene the scene the scene because i feel like in some is in some sense this could be applied to all drugs i think there's a kind of an over stigmatization of gsb in some instances because it's only really affecting a very small group of people i, I know i know the scene is somewhat big but essentially it's a very small subsect of people and they are legitimate and that small subsect of people there are, there are people within that small sect that are taking it to the extremes that are going way too far with it because i'm sure there are people who are doing it safely and who are enjoying themselves having a good time but some people are going overboard and ones who are going overboard are the ones who are willing to sit and wait for somebody to get to come to consciousness or whatever to wake up for one hour because they're afraid of the ambulance comes and might get in trouble or whatnot it might ruin their party they'd rather wait for an hour and i'm assuming at that time when she's waking up and they're pouring water over her head and you know he's humming whatever he's whatever he's humming you know sweet nothings into their ear that there's probably people in the toilets doing lines at the same time. Imagine that flipping, that contrast of having somebody comatose, right? Um, probably losing color in their face, maybe <laughs> hopefully still breathing, and you're in, the, you're in the toilet railing lines. Just imagine that. <laughs> but I thought this exchange was hilarious. Were you on just beat that time? Yeah. But look at this. Look at instantly what happens there. A rare moment of introspection, a rare moment of like reflection and of kind of, acknowledging of like the part that you may have played in the situation and how detrimental the entire thing was the fact that this person was laid out and you were there whispering sweet nothings into their ear to make them feel better but you were also high off your head blah 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 all this sort of stuff should be kind of laid bare right to kind of really show the ugly side of things but it's not it turns immediately Nick is like, no, 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 no. I'm always a hero of my own story. And it switches it instantly. Point was able to reason whether or not I'm on G. It's not that I become, I actually don't become a nasty person. I just become, I just be, was becoming apathetic, meaning like it was hard for me to get into my emotions. <laughs> but when there's something like that. He's a nasty person. Who wants to talk to somebody that has no emotions? <laughs> so shocking where i first entered the club uh first entered the party scene here where i was a little where at the time i was much less desensitized to what life and death was so to me i was literally seeing oh my god this person could may not wake up i gotta do something i have to be there for her and through time i noticed even for myself it became less it became less of a shock to me which is what also anyway whatever you get the point so my point in this whole thing is not to bash the nicholas rose person but essentially, I think what this could be was a good learning moment for all people, myself included. I think I've come to a resolution. I came to this realization, sorry, a long time ago. And I think I was quite lucky because I started in this scene, what, promoting parties and stuff and putting parties on and whatnot. And, you know, having to play because of that, not because I had these big aspirations of becoming an extra Ricardo of the Lobos, but then over time, my level of appreciation for the scene kind of grew. And then as soon as I started to kind of, you know because i did this whole weird experiment thing where i was like you know what i feel like i'm getting too wrapped up in the drugs and the drinking I, but i know that i love this thing because you know outside of doing some other things i don't really have any other occasion where i'm social and clubs are the only time where i actually got to meet people posting some clips online you get comments from people that want to go out sharing stuff on instagram people will reply back to you sometimes going out and about people will see you around about if you're out all the time those things kind of added to how i was you know able to maybe kind of gain new friends quote unquote so it was important to me that i was able to get to a point where i felt like i wasn't only going out to do it i wasn't i wasn't only going out for an excuse to get high or to get drunk i need to be sure that was true so one thing that i did um, which i was happy that i was able to follow through with i think a few years or a couple of years sorry was i was i went on like a dry january sober february kind of thing like i, was, I, I think i maybe went into it right up until my birthday around april time so I kind of did a good four month stint. And in between that time, I did, I went to Berlin, I think for January or February, one of those months where it was fashion week out there or sometime of something, some, some, some big event happened. I forgot what it was, maybe fashion week or something. 
And at that at that time, I went there. I had all the connections of people that I knew out there in the industry who invited me to all these brand events with free drinking stuff. And the moment I was around that sort of stuff, and I was didn't have the urge to get how get drunk. That's when I knew, okay, cool, I can do this. I can be in the scene. I can go out. I can club. I can party without doing those things. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm gonna tell you the truth and say clubbing without the ability to drink or do drugs is terrible. Especially if you that's a, especially if you experienced it on those things. It's not like it's great. But if you can do it, it's really important to do it as often as you can, especially if you go out a lot. Because I feel like going out a lot and doing drugs all the time also, it's just not um, con- conductive. It's not constructive. It's not going to be, it's not healthy in any way, shape or form. And in general, you don't necessarily get the best out of the experience when you're going out, in my opinion. I don't think you know, you really do. I think sometimes going out a few times sober really does get makes you appreciate the music that you're obsessed with listening to in heaven. Because for the most part, when I'm at home or when I'm on a run listening to mixes and stuff, I'm not listening to them drunk or high. I'm listening to them sober. So if you can enjoy them at home, you should be able to enjoy them in a club like that way. So that's a really big part of it. But outside of that, watching this interview, it kind of really did re- reaffirm to me why it's so important to try to ground yourself in something real outside of these frivolous things like going to clubs and stuff because you know these are leisurely activities that there are somewhat you know necessary i understand but these kind of extracurricular things that you do should be things that you do on the side but there should be other things that you do in your life day to day that kind of give you a sense of purpose so that you're not trying to frame your entire personality around going out in clubs because to me in my opinion i can't think of anything more um sad in my opinion to be at this person's big age crying and complaining about certain things that happen to you out in line trying to you know trying to kind of grasp some level of identity behind it and stuff and trying to advocate for certain things when at the core of it there are issues internally that you kind of have to deal with that have nothing to do with the clubs and maybe the reaction or the kind of expression of that is what has happened with the drugs this interview kind of didn't really get to the heart of anything essentially it kind of felt like it was an interview where he kind of was sorry where they tried to frame themselves as this kind of drug advocacy person without having necessarily done the work i think being two months sober doesn't necessarily give you any right to come out and preach and start telling people or start lecturing people to what they should and shouldn't do i feel like if anything maybe there should be a, a sounding alarm that could be a little clip but to sit down for an hour plus talking about the highs and lows of a drug that you just you know are on the way to kind of get yourself sorted from is really really disingenuous in my opinion especially especially when you consider all of these comments that i've been reading online regarding the person themselves and maybe some of the previous things that they may or may not have done um in the past and again this you take it again with a pinch of salt i don't really know if some of these comments are true or not but these are random comments that i've been pulling from reddit where people have been kind of discussing some of the um issues or discussing the person at the center of that interview which is nicholas and kind of talking about some of the issues that they've been having with them interacting with them in the clubbing space so this is one person says as follows aha this made me sick to see these videos i remember him i remember nicholas i guess doing g 18 years old with an 18 year old girl and pushing to take more and when she was collapsing he wanted to put some speed up her nose instead to just check on her and let her sleep by the way most of the people um, nicholas was hanging out with was mostly 18 to 19 year olds discovering drugs and queer scene so easy audience to manipulate easy money from one day i was at a girl's place and nicholas said he was on his way and the message was like do you have any juice left the person said no and he answered two minutes later saying oh sorry i can't come anymore don't remember the excuse exactly but that was a generic one this guy is an attention seeker and really toxic person always looking for service their own interest he's not uh nicholas is not a close friend but during the pandemic i met nicholas a lot and everything about nicholas uh is he needs constant validation with others and if you disagree or dare to challenge their views they'll publicly accuse you of racism or homophobia i mean this only happens if you manage to say quote within without being cut off he's they're a great speaker and by the way it doesn't shy away from making nasty remarks about the english or people who don't speak it at all was that and doesn't shy nasty remarks about the english or people who don't speak it well as he does in public um he is also extremely brain fucked by the whole techno babe fame who how many followers do you have who do you know to talk to do you have guest lists every little thing is a reason for him to raise drama and everything is related to the skin color if you listen to him actually what he does to rso is so fucked up in my opinion 
opinion and put so much people in the shit by calling them racist the way that he's kicked out and definitely unacceptable and justify a complaint or other procedures but raising this theory as racist attack was so fucked up i also remember that he made a story one day of how he was choked after being denied at Bergheim. so clearly there is a lot of um questions question marks around the person's character and um for me these comments aside because there's plenty of them here on the screen as you can see yeah no person can confirm this guy's a scam i know him for a long time through the dance world in the states and in berlin i can confirm he's a narcissist an opportunist and a snake oil salesman he is a really intelligent appraisal on broken people claiming to be a saving voice of change of marginalized groups of people when in reality he just creates drama as stated publicly above he's extremely entitled constantly asking for money for support on a project people believe him support him and nobody sees any of his claimed projects fucking scam i could go on for days and i said i agree instantly dislike the guy from when he cancelled rso um they even give him a job someone says yeah no fucking way so clearly there's issues with this person clearly there's issues there is issues right with their integrity and whatnot there was a person but i felt like there was a really good actually quote here i took i think it's this one right um regarding the issue with ghb and i feel like this maybe is a far more better um sounding alarm in general for the ills of g and for why people should probably stay away from it than maybe what you know nicholas maybe spoke about and how nicholas kind of framed it because it kind of felt like you know nothing really bad did happen it was kind of handled really good i'm a strong person there was loads there, was, there wasn't really a lot of personal responsibility and a lot of real honesty and really bearing of soul in terms of actually getting to the truth of what actually happened and acknowledging some of the mistakes and missteps that that person's done because if it was me and i was talking about stuff you have to you'd have to be you know excruciate excruciating excruciatingly whatever that word is honest about it and how negative it's affected you because we know i think most of us who go out a lot we know how dark and how bad it can get from you know being a person who says oh, i don't drink at home suddenly you're drinking at home so being a person who says, i don't do stuff for drugs at home suddenly you're doing drugs at home it can slowly and quickly get to that position just from you going out and being in the scene a lot and not addressing things that are going on in your life that may be affecting you in a way that are making you lash out or kind of reaching those things as an outlet to kind of soothe your pain or whatever you're going through my opinion or maybe especially if you're directional because i feel like a lot of people in the scene and i guess what i've seen here don't have a purpose or are looking for some sort of position you know maybe you're you know you're a struggling dj maybe you're trying to produce maybe you're trying to get involved in the scene and work behind the scene in clubs and whatnot and you're not getting there and sometimes to compensate with that you've to kind of feel like you're involved you kind of you know get lapped into this drug community within clubs and you feel like that is a scene in itself and you dress up in a certain way and you dance in a certain way you hang out with certain people and you feel like that's a personality in itself and that's kind of giving you purpose but in the end it's only so much only destroying your life but anyway i thought like this person really encapsulated what um how bad ghb can be the person as follows um so i haven't watched the interview yet not sure i need to i've been through the meat grinder hardcore i woke up having to pee still high as hell fell in the hallway right into the hat rack my foot got stuck in it and broke right in the middle crutches for two weeks oh my god i got kicked out of a woman's apartment because i behaved like a piece of trash and almost broke her mirror i fell down the stairs lost consciousness my body blocked the path and i woke up after a tenant had to step over me i had no idea where i was oh my days oh why i had to walk through an unknown part of town without shoes phone ipod and headphones some other woman found the stuff called a friend of mine i picked it up at the police station i looked at them shr shrugging my shoulders because i didn't know what else to say they seemed to a tad perplexed i collapsed in a coat rack so i collapsed in a coat checks area at burkine while taking talking to a friend of friends i'm lucky no bouncer was around and the two friends rushed me to the toilets which happens quite often in most clubs in general most it's not just a burkine issue it's always, oh, Bergheim's always you know not really paying attention to people not caring and not looking after their well-being essentially they they don't really have the resources i'm assuming so many people come through that club some people get too fucked up and it's kind of a personal responsibility type of thing i'd imagine also but they generally try to let your friends deal with it and of course if their friends can't deal with it on you on your own you just get chucked out and kind of you have to figure it out on your own that way which can be a bit harsh but i think most clubs do it because you just don't want the heat from local councils even a place like berlin which is kind of you know has a very good relationship with clubs in general they even go out of their way to try to make sure that they distance themselves with people who are messed up so you it kind of you're taking a you're taking a calculated risk because you're gonna get super messed up 
you're not going to be aware of your surroundings and you might get separated from your group and it might lead to you getting thrown out without your belonging so keep that in mind it continues here um the zenith or let's maybe call it the nadir of my addiction included taking eight millimeters of gbl not gb ghb to sleep waking up one hour 1.5 hours later i'm still sorry one, one hour five later another eight mil and so on if you start to take if you start taking it for sleeping you're royally screwed yeah imagine that that's like doing coke to go to sleep god almighty i went through heavy withdrawals ended up getting the dt's delirium terums emergency room the fact that i'm still alive after things escalated to the point of eight millimeters is really mind-boggling an idiot's luck but i was oblivious to the damage it can and most of the time will do what i still have some but it's not at my place i take a dose or two at burger if someone has it on them and two two or 2.3 mil max that's just enough to give me a nice buzz i'm not proud of anything that happened to me i was ruined it ruined relationships and it almost ruined another i'm telling this as a warning and for me i don't feel like i got any of this sincerity any of this bearing of soul any of this honesty any of this blunt tr you know truth from that entire one hour and 10 minute interview of Nicholas Rose, it felt like a weird political positive spin on things to kind of rewrite the narrative or whatever's going on over there in Berlin. Because again, Playful Magazine is a Berlin publication. So maybe there is conversation around Nicholas in the scene that Nicholas felt like they had to address. And this is a way to address it. I don't really know. But I just feel like as a platform, maybe interviewing somebody on under the guise of sobriety and drug safety awareness, who's only been sober for two months, if that is really negligent, in my opinion, especially considering all of the bad, you know, car, what, bad vibes and bad anecdotes, anecdotal stories around, you know, Nicholas and previous things have happened and whatnot. I saw some people in the comments um, complaining about the interview and not really grilling Nicholas and kind of, you know, pushing back on certain things. I don't really think that's fair. I think Playful Magazine, why I really like it for the most part is that it gives people in the scene a platform to speak and to kind of share and kind of talk about their experiences and i feel like sometimes in those kind of arenas it's not really needed to be you know combative or to be inquisitive in that way if you want that you know maybe you do an interview and kind of ask some of those grilling questions but for the most part you don't really hear from these people some of them try to stay away from press or explain themselves in any kind of way because sometimes the mystique is better than the reality as i said previously before i think most people once they get to know actual DJs will realize that most of them are pretty lame. They're pretty boring. Like the only most interesting thing about them is the fact that they can DJ or produce really well. And I think for the most part, if you are wrapped up in a scene, you're better off trying to find your own way forward, starting your own night, starting your own label, starting your own little thing, than trying to befriend popular DJs. It doesn't really go anywhere, really, for the most part. You know, if it's a girl, they're not going to fuck you, really, for the most part, because they've probably got better options and they don't give a fuck. And if it's a guy, they've got many guys out there who are willing to kind of, you know, get on their knees, you know, for a flipping guest spot. So you are one of many. So just probably focus on your own thing if you actually want to get involved. Then I feel like having the respect or the acknowledgement of an artist on an artistic point of view should be the thing to go to look for as opposed to trying to be overly fanatic and be a fan of them that way. I feel like that's one thing that kind of, I feel like makes being into dance music quite cool. You can be a fan of somebody without ever wanting to interact with them ever in the slightest. Like from once, you know, I'm a big fan of Dixon and I love everything that he does at Indivision, but I don't want to be his friend. Yeah, you know? I just want to fucking enjoy the music. I want to be able to go and see him perform live, um, you know, buy some merch here and there. Maybe if I'm if I'm at the front of the booth, I can wave or something. That's been amazing. But there's no a willingness or there's no kind of desire for me to kind of make them to be one of my friends or whatnot, so we can hang out and go what restaurants and stuff. It doesn't make any sense. So maybe a lot of that whole overconsumption of drugs is a kind of again a weird way to kind of feel like you're close to it because you're not really close to it. You're not really doing the thing you want to do. I'm not really too sure. But in general, I thought the interview was a little bit it didn't really do anything it didn't really go anywhere um if anything it kind of raised more questions than anything but you know maybe the conversation having it out there in the first place is good for the most part people are going to be talking about it in an honest way and we're going to see where it goes from there but i feel like you know having somebody that's not a year in in their sobriety speaking about it doesn't really make any sense but that's just my opinion